All right, I'm coming back to Hitman 2. Uh, this time I'm going to be playing this mission called Chasing a Ghost. Uh, I know nothing about it. Uh, Hitman 2, of course, came out a couple of years ago, and I consider myself a massive Hitman fan. And yet, because I just t it takes me so much time uh, and sort of emotional investment to play through a Hitman level the way I like to play it, I fall way behind the release schedule. I am, like, less than a week away from the release of Hitman 3, and I haven't even played most of these missions from the previous game. Um, Cloudcraft in the chat points out the fact that, uh, that that's actually a really bad thing for a Hitman uh, player to do uh, because uh, Hitman releases all of this extra content around the time of the release of the game. And uh, if you're sort of following the game live, you get to have all these extra experiences, elusive targets and stuff like that, uh, that you don't get to have if you're just playing the game years and years later. He, he points out that all of their you know uh, sort of bonus content is server dependent and, and it's calendar dependent and uh, if you miss it then you miss it which I'm sure actually does help them in a lot of ways because it you know it sort of boosts up their audience during a critical period when people are still excited about the game still buying the game it's still being featured on stores uh, things like that so it's it's really good for them and I and I want wish them all the success but at the same time as a player who you know for whatever reason I'm bad at playing hitman games when they're brand new uh, it leaves me in kind of in the lurch so I'm going to try to catch up with Hitman 2 so that I'm ready for Hitman 3 when it comes out and I can actually play it like a proper Hitman fan in time with all the new content. So, Cloudcraft really wants to point out, though, that aside from the fact that he's, you know, calling out this uh, problem with Hitman, he actually has tons of praise for it. He, he, he loves the game. Good evening, 47. The militia has released a hostage tape, outing the existence of Providence to the world. This was a fatal mistake, and our analysts are tracing its origin as we speak. In the meantime, we have a lead on Lucas Gray's top lieutenant. Turns out the Delgado cartel's counterfeiting unit was creating fake IDs for the militia, and one operative in particular stands out, Wazir Kale, an infamous South China sea pirate, better known by his nom de guerre, the Maelstrom. The Maelstrom and his cutthroat band of outlaws were the scourge of the shipping industry in the post-recession years. But his reign of terror came to an end with the disastrous 2014 hijacking of the supertanker, Francis King. Chinese elite forces stormed the ship, resulting in the deaths of a dozen sailors and most of the Maelstrom's crew. But Carle slipped away unseen. The Maelstrom's connection to Grey is unknown. But we believe it was he who carried out the audacious killing of a Providence CEO in Shanghai, along with two reactivated members of his old pirate gang, Vanya Shaw, a shady figure in Mumbai's criminal underworld, and Darwood Rangan, the gang's old cashier turned dodgy movie producer. Shaw, Rangan, and the Maelstrom form Lucas Gray's Eastern Cell. They are a crack strike team, and stopping them is our client's most pressing concern. Unfortunately, the elusive maelstrom appears to have vanished into the seedy underbelly of Mumbai, the cradle of his criminal legend, and no one knows his whereabouts or what he currently looks like. So, a bandit queen, a showbiz charlatan, and one certifiable ghost. I shall leave you to prepare. Interesting. Okay, so I don't even know the identity of one of the people that I'm going after. We've got Vanya Shah. Dawood Rangan and the Maelstrom. <laughs> we don't know what this person looks like. I don't think I've ever been in that situation before where I go into a mission without a clear photo of who it is that I'm targeting. Um, and so I imagine they probably also will not be highlighted in red when I first enter the level. Uh, and I guess I wonder if there's just going to be one way that I find out their identity. I mean, they they must have multiple ways that I could find out the identity. Otherwise, it wouldn't feel like a Hitman game. So I'm, I am fascinated to find out how this goes. So I'm assuming I don't really have a lot of uh, options here. I do have that fish. I love my fish. Okay, so I was wondering about this. So I, in the previous mission, I did unlock some new equipment. But I'm getting the sense... So in previous Hitman games, I feel like... I would unlock equipment over time as I was playing through mission after mission, um, and then I could bring all of that equipment into any mission that I went after. It feels like I might actually have to unlock the equipment level by level, uh, map by map in this world. So like, like I can't use the lockpick in this map until I've played this map without a lockpick. 
and uh, and then unlocked the lockpick. I'm not sure that that's the case. It certainly is what it looks like, because I don't have any new unlockables here. Um, so yeah, so nothing to do with planning, because uh, I can't really change anything. Difficulty professional is what I've selected, so let's get to it. <laughs> um, talk talk on YouTube is making me uncomfortable. Uh, let's see here. So Java Moon soon says, weirdest thing, I came home and was fully planning on some Valhalla. Started it, looked at it, closed it. Uh, now I'm watching Jeff. Uh, so I do that all the time. Like, like I'll, I'll come home and I'll be like, you know, I'll come into my office and I'll be like, <laughs> I say come home like I ever leave the house. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll come to my office and I'll be like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I want to play this game. And as soon as I look at the game, I suddenly don't have the energy to play it. Really big games sometimes Welcome do that to, to me. Mumbai, hmm. One of the most densely populated cities in the world, home to more than 12 million people. If you wanted to disappear and hide from the world, this vast city is perfect. The maze-like sprawling slums offer secret paths and surprises around every corner. The elusive Maelstrom knows the city like the back of his own hand. Locating him will be a considerable challenge. A place to start could be the slums where his former gang, the Crows, has recently risen from the ashes. Darwood Rangan will be easy to find in his half-finished tower, wrapping up his new film called Mumbai Hero. While Vanya Shah has ensconced herself in the overgrown remains of an old train yard. Your three targets call this labyrinthine part of the city home, so choose your approach carefully. I love that idea of needing to sort of invade someone's home territory, a place where they know what they know everything and they can blend in. And I am uh, clearly a foreigner here. <laughs> I do not belong. <laughs> um, also, they, they really picked some like really nice. Uh, oh, what am I trying to say? Like um, striking imagery for where these places are going to be. A half-finished office building is actually. A really common sight in like the in the in the dense cities of India, uh, you know, where, where sometimes you'll have like you know, a, a big, pro a huge project because some of these cities are growing so fast. People will launch in these huge projects. The projects won't necessarily make it all the way to completion, but sometimes they'll even still be used. Uh, you know, they'll be you know they partly finished and and in use, and for some reason the project will go bad. And that's and that's actually not that uncommon in cities like this. I I worked a couple of times in uh, Hyderabad, which is you know not Mumbai. But uh, I, I don't know. That was that was a familiar sight there, and it makes me, uh, wow, this city. The sheer number of people that the Hitman team can put into a level is mind blowing. <laughs> like I mean, you, you see, they must be making a lot of, um, you know, basically cutting a lot of corners with these characters' AI. What you what you usually I think see in cases like this is most of these characters have next to no AI. They're they're you know off in the corners and basically all they do is either stand in place, or um, you know follow a very simple routine where it's just like do this, or check to see what's next, to do that, check to see what's next, and that's all it is. They don't they don't have to be detecting anything, worrying about anything, um, unless they get into some kind of weird trouble. But uh, but usually like there's there'll be a bubble around your character where all the characters get smarter and they're able to react to your actions and, and stuff like that. I'm imagining maybe they're doing something along those lines. I can't promise it though. I mean, just I've never made a game that had this level of, <laughs> of humanity just scattered around. Okay, so let's have a look at our map. Now that I'm done just sort of wandering around the city and being amazed at it. Uh, okay, so the train yard, Vanya, is over here. Dawood Rangan is over here in the building. I'm kind of facing Dawood, and, and, and they did sort of highlight him as being sort of the easier one, so maybe I'll start there. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, because uh, that dude over there seems to um, be able to recognize me immediately if I get too close, so... I'm just not going to worry about him. Let's let's head over this way. As before, like I did in Colombia, um, I'm not going to be going after these uh, opportunities over here. Uh, eventually, I'd like to come back to all these levels and, and find all the opportunities, but I want to play some old school Hitman and just sort of feel my way through 
and see what I could figure out on my own. Okay, so there was a front entrance there. I assume that front entrance is well guarded. Um, that, you know, I can get a certain distance in, but somebody's going to have a problem with me. And so I'm going to walk around the back here and see if there are any other entrances. Okay, so these guys... I'm afraid you don't have the right clearance. Sorry. Uh, that's okay, man. I'm fine. So, the one, one way I like to think about this phase of Hitman, because... You know, eventually I'll usually replay each level and I will, um, you know, try to use what I learned from previous playthroughs to, you know, to accomplish things I couldn't normally, I wouldn't have been able to figure out on my first playthrough. And, uh, you know, because Age of 47 is not, you know, like Tom Cruise's character from Edge of Tomorrow or something like that, um, that's not realistic. But what I like to imagine is that these these what these early playthroughs where I don't really know what I'm doing, what they represent in my mind is him doing research in advance. You know, even though research does not actually involve performing the actual hit again and again and again in real life, uh, which is, you know, what it what I'm actually playing through. I just still imagine that, you know, that extra knowledge that I bring into uh, into future playthroughs that, yeah, that what that represents is. Age of 47 having just done a ton of recon uh, before the hit. All right, so that guy is real close to that other guy. Oh, and look, there's more guys. Hmm. All right, so I thought maybe there would be some opportunity here for me to grab an outfit, something like that, but it looks like maybe not. Okay, I was about to start taking off that direction, but now these guys are coming. Oh, my gosh, do, do not come close to me. Go, go somewhere else, dudes. Go somewhere else. Oh, and now is this guy, this guy... Okay, good. He's not quite coming back yet. All right. Okay, now, there is a potential distraction there. I wonder what happens. Okay, so that guy's going to come over and see that. Shut up. Like I learned last time, you always have to... Oh, gosh, is he going to see that his friend is unconscious? Okay, good. You always want to let them turn off uh, their own distraction before you grab them. Uh, because otherwise you have to manually turn it off yourself and it might pull another person in. We saw that with the chefs in Colombia. Okay, so let's disguise as this guy. Let's pick up his gun. Where's his gun? There's his gun. Okay, his other guys are not here yet. Oh, nope, they are here. Nope. Well, that didn't go well. Dang, this guy can take some bullets. And it, oh, this gun suck too. Okay, okay. We didn't save before this, but now we know how likely that is to happen, so we can avoid it next time. So uh, earlier when I was talking about um, you know the fact that there's all this live service stuff that goes on surrounding... Okay, Mumbai. shush. Shush, Diana. Um, there's all this live service stuff that goes on around uh, a release of a Hitman game um, that's easy for people who aren't there uh, live uh, to miss. Um, and so Java Monsoon wants to know, um, is that is that a thing that the designers at Undead Labs account for, with State of Decay 2 being a live service title? Um, so, yeah, it is. So so one of the things that we are working on like right now, actually, is uh, is trying to automate a lot of like a lot of the content that we've been sort of manually releasing um uh over time you know things like like bounty broker content for instance we've been manually issuing updates that change the bounty broker and, and that add new things to the game that cycle through uh the challenges that are available but our long-term goal is not to make people dependent on us 
launching events in order to make that stuff happen. Uh, we're working on, on automating it, basically, so that even after, at some point, when we're done working on State of Decay 2 and, we, and we've moved on to other things, um, you know, we will, uh, this, the game will be able to sort of run itself in the background. Uh, we got pretty close to that uh, with the Year One Survival Edition of State of Decay 1. Um, it's got this set of, uh, of 12 challenges uh, that are sort of based on the calendar, um, and those are all manually set up. Like, each time a new challenge is launched, somebody has to actually go and push a button at their desk, uh, you know, to make it happen. And, um, and so that wasn't automated, but despite the fact that, uh, that we haven't actually worked on State of Decay 1, in a really long time, there is someone at Microsoft every single month who sends me an email and says, "Hey, are you ready for us to release this new challenge for uh, for the Year One Survival Edition? Uh, it's sort of a new, basically a new sort of rerun of an old challenge on uh, the Year One Survival Edition." And so I always check it out, make sure this is the right one, uh, approve it, and and we keep it going. So even if you know the Year One Survival Edition, uh, actually the original State of Decay was launched in 2013. It's a pretty old game at this point, but there are still, you know, new versions of the same old challenges being launched every single month. Um, and so so we want it to have, we, you know, we want State of K 2 to have that kind of longevity, but we want it to even be to be better than, uh, than you know, what went on with, with the first game. And so we don't want it to be necessary for somebody at Microsoft somewhere to press a button in order to keep it going, we want it to be able to just run itself. So, uh, so that's what we're working on. And uh, at some point, pretty soon, we'll probably be able to announce it that, that that's where we are. That we've got a, uh, you know, that we've got a schedule that sort of keeps itself going. And so that kind of live content, that kind of like you know, hey, there's some new challenges today. You know that 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 kind of stuff uh, will still be a little part of the game even after we're done directly supporting it. Okay, so I'm assuming that I'm in a different part of the cycle, and those guys are not going to see me dump their friend in a box. Okay, cool. So now, that guy will not recognize me. He's like, he's just been hanging out with his friend right here. I'm wearing his friend's clothes. Totally is not going to recognize me at all. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> that's sort of just, I mean, in real life, that's not how it would work precisely. But, it, you know, one thing that, that, you, that the way that I think about video game mechanics. I'm going to save over my Columbia save. So I don't always think of video game mechanics as being, you know, one-to-one -one with the reality that they're simulating. Um, you know, it's not like, it's like, for instance, you, know, you watch a, um, you watch a movie, you watch a, a TV show, like say 24, that's supposed to happen in real time, right? Oh, hello. Um, you never see the characters go to the bathroom. You know, or, or whatever, and that's fine. You don't want to see that. You know, you imagine that when they're off screen, at some point they go to the bathroom, and you just kind of don't care. Um, you don't actually have to watch that part of it to understand. You know that it's yeah, it's not a completely accurate rendition of reality, but that's that's kind of not the point. They're, they're there to tell a story, and you can kind of fill in the gaps yourself for how it would work if it were actually actually real. And um, you know, similarly, while. Yeah, the actual, the, like, the, the moment to moment depiction of Agent 47, you know, knocking at a guy, taking his clothes, and having all of that guy's co workers, like, not recognize that their friend has been replaced. Moment to moment, that's silly. But you're not supposed to take it like it's this, like, the specific events are happening. It's more like, well, a hitman could pretend to be a security guard and could get into a position like this with people not questioning him. Oh, they're revealing a mission story. Oh, up above me. Interesting. Oh, man, I love that accent. But uh, I'm not going to listen to that because we are not doing uh, mission stories right now. We are just exploring and taking this guy out in whatever way I can improvise in the moment. Ranith Gord points out that the 10-year anniversary of State of Decay 1 is coming up in a couple of years. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I hadn't really been thinking about that, but because, uh, you know, it's a couple years away. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll do something for it. I have no idea what, but I'm sure we will. Oh, and hi, Ariakas. Thanks for joining us. 
Okay, so I can definitely get into the building this way. The thing I'm not sure of is why? Or like, <laughs> I'm just, I'm really just sort of feeling my way around here. Okay, so I don't want to, do I really want to hang in front of this window? That seems like a weird thing that would get attention. Oh, who's this? Is she a movie star? So, the reason the accent uh, stood out to me was because I actually just I just listened to a Rock Paper Shotgun podcast about the fact that uh, in some Hitman games, you know, they just sort of got generic British voice actors to do all of the characters in every location, and so everyone just sounded like they were from England. Okay, none of these people have dots over their heads, but I'm a little bit freaked out. Like, they might gain dots the moment I climb up. And so I definitely want no nobody to be looking at me when I give it a try. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so just the fact that these characters really do sound like they are, you know, at least to my ears, sound like they're from Mumbai. Uh, that makes <laughs> that makes a big difference to my immersion in the world. Let's see here. Oh, uh, so Tiendil asks, uh, any info on what the next live stream on Monday will be about? Yeah, uh, Monday's live stream isn't going to have uh, the, the, I'm talking about the official State of Decay 2 live stream. Um, Monday's live stream is not going to have uh, any like info on new updates or anything like that. It's going to be a strategy stream with Joe Swarner. Uh, so we'll be going over, you know, how to survive in the lethal zone, stuff like that. He's already done some like early game strategy stuff. Oh, okay. That guy's going to recognize me. Nobody else cares though. That's pretty cool. Okay, there's a couple of guards who are going to see me. But they're not on this side of the building. And none of them seem to be upstairs, at least not close to me upstairs. So where's Rangan? He's up there. Okay, okay, there's a couple of guys. Those guys up there will detect me if I come upstairs. He's right there. Okay, well, let's explore this level. Okay, we got a bathroom. Which oftentimes, yes, okay, here's a closet. Good, okay, so if I need to attract someone in here and get a different outfit, like if I need to have this outfit, the uh, the, the guy in the suit, like that might help me get upstairs uh, under better conditions. Oh, I just realized... Um, I expected to have an entire floor to explore here, but this is just like a mezzanine, so there's not much I can do here aside from attract somebody into the bathroom. All right, so before I do that, let's just quickly save because I don't want to do all that climbing again. <laughs> Good morning, Smug Rainbow Pony. Oh, so this is the Mumbai level uh, in, in Hitman 2. Uh, Smug Rainbow Pony was asking which level this is because it didn't look familiar. It looks like it's a really varied mission. I mean, we've got this, you know, sort of like unfinished, but pretty high class office building. Then we've got also got sort of uh, an abandoned train yard, which I imagine will, will be the opposite end of the spectrum. Okay, so let's get someone in here. I love the way they make these doors work, by the way. They just sort of like subtly animate the doors. All right. And, of course, we always have to collect all these guns. There's a part of me that always kind of wishes that there was a way to, like, once you've found a particular gun, uh, like, be able to bring it into missions from then on. I don't think that's actually how it works, but, yeah. Is my jacket a little too small for me? I don't know. Anyway, okay, so now I've got a different outfit on. Oh, that guy's right there. Oh, man. Okay, so now that I've got this outfit, I'm going to save again. I can usually switch back if I think that this is the wrong outfit, so uh, I'm going to overwrite and not worry about it.
So Tiendil says, it looks like you need a lot of patience to play this game. And Smug Rainbow Pony agrees, but says, you can also go the impatient way. Uh, it's just hard to survive. Yeah, you can take a few bullets in this game, but it's really not built to be a shooter where you just run around doing whatever you want. Okay, so it looks like this didn't really improve my situation that much uh, when it comes to being able to pass up here. Okay, so he is down there. That is Darwood Rangan, producer of mediocre movies and a full-time criminal. His brutality is overshadowed only by his giant ego. Okay, so that guy's moving on, but he's going to be staying with Dawood. Oh, gosh, what's happening here? Okay, there's stuff I could tamper with. Oh, look, there's a, there's a thing I could probably hit him with. Oh, man. I bet that's a really cool opportunity right there. If I had a wrench, I could loosen the valve on this thing. Maybe set him on fire. I'm assuming he's going to do something terrible to that person. Uh, oh, this is probably where the security cameras are? Uh, maybe not. I don't know. Okay, so we've got a generator here, which you can usually use to attract people. That guy is going to notice if I go by. Yeah, is he holding that guy over the edge? Okay, so... If that guy wasn't there to recognize me, I could probably walk out and just push that guy off the ledge. Of course, somebody would still see me. I need to see the rest of this guy's routine, though. He's got to go somewhere where I can pull him out. What's going on over here? Okay, there's the back of that guard who can recognize me. And there's a place to stick guards. Okay, I'm actually curious what that was. Rangan has put out a freelance contract on Vanya Shah in response to having put one out on him. All is not well in Mumbai. Oh, so they all want each other dead. That's great. Okay. That didn't go well. All right. Well, that was an accident. I thought that guy had his back to me. And he absolutely did not by the time I opened the door. So, now I know the spot exists, though. And it might still be possible for me to do something with it. So uh, Rah uh, Rahul uh, Baskaran says uh, there are unlocks for specific guns, so you can bring them into other missions. Yeah, so so I, I realized that there are unlocks for them, but I, I just, I think what I had in my head was I wish that when I picked up the gun, that was how I unlocked it. Just as a player, that's like, ooh, that would be neat. Um, that doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. There's a lot of things that I want as a player sometimes that if I actually had the broader view of the game and how it works, would not actually be the best choice. Okay, so... Now I know something about uh, navigating the space up here. So timing is just everything in this game. So that guy's being watched. I'm just trying to think, is there something 
propane flask. Hmm. I'm trying to think if if there's some obvious way. So what, what where does this thing connect? Where how is it controlled? I can't look up high enough. Oh, up there. Okay. Now how do you get It looks like there's no way to climb up to this crane. So I don't know if there's a way to do something with it. So maybe this thing can just be dropped. I, I was imagining maybe it could be swung over to hit him. But maybe it can only be dropped. Maybe there, I have to some, find some way to get him out of the building if I want to use that thing as a weapon. Huh, crowbar might be useful. There's a guy right outside that door. This time I'm just going to get rid of this dude immediately because I was waiting. I waited for him to leave last time, and that ended up not being great because then you know somebody was in the wrong position. By the time I was able to go through the door and consider moving somebody else around over here, so yeah, see that guy's walking around again. Okay, so he does seem to move around fairly often, and there's nobody else close to him. Next time he walks to the left, I might be able to get in behind him, take him out too. I'm not sure why I want to do that exactly, but it does seem like he's, you know, anyone who can recognize me is a danger, so... Oh, what? I'm stuck without a key card? Oh, wait. There we go. Luxury apartment key card. All right. So, let's save us having done that. So far, unlike uh, in Colombia, I haven't left a body lying around somewhere. Somebody's likely to find it. So I'm pretty confident continuously, like, overriding my save. Because I don't think I've done anything I'm likely to regret. Yeah, so Flowback Tron wants me to uh, uh, mention that I could pause and I could look over at, uh, at opportunities. I think that actually might be on the map side. Uh, mission stories is what they're called now. Um, so yeah, so just for those of you who just joined us, uh, I'm deliberately avoiding these for my first playthrough. Uh, I love these things. They're often really, really cool, but it's also just kind of walking through a process somebody else has laid out. I kind of like the process of feeling my way through a level the very first time I play it. And then later on, I'll probably go back and try out all of those different ways to play. Oh, whoa, whoa. Wait, what? Hold on a second. That didn't go the way I thought it would. Made a bunch of noise, and I thought I was behind him. Okay, luckily I saved right there. So let's let's try this again. Okay, and that guy is a worry. I didn't realize that he was so close. So the thing is, getting into a fight makes noise. Fiber wire, which is what I was trying to use, doesn't. So I think maybe I just hit the wrong button or something. I'm not sure. Let's Let's look at what I did. So yeah, and, and another thing that I do really like, Smug Rainbow Pony uh, points this out, is that a lot of those opportunities, I mean, even though you can pick them from a menu, you can also uh, f just find them in the world. And so I actually, the next time I play this, I will probably... Yeah, so nobody's watching. There we go. I think it was just a weird little bug. Oh, dang. Who is it that's seeing me do this? So it says unnoticed kill, but I guess... They saw me with the body? It's full. Okay, so I said I was unlikely to regret what I'd done so far. I actually do regret it. 
because I filled this with bodies and I can't put him there. So now I've got to put some thought into this. This might take a little bit of reloading. But, because I might need to like do some recon and then come back to this save to use what I learned. <laughs> so, normally, this isn't the problem that you have, your body trunk being full. Oh, interesting. Okay, so that guy, he comes right around a corner at that very moment. So if I don't just charge right at this guy and take him out super fast to get him right around the corner, I'm going to get seen by this dude. Now, I could just kill both, but, uh, you know, that's not the best way to do it. Okay, he's with his bodyguard now. All right, so I know this is a place he sometimes goes. Okay. The only reason I did that is because uh, he now doesn't have the guy who's following him. Like, he's he's got someone who's assigned to follow him, and I think sometimes someone will have, like, you know like relief bodyguards who fill in if they lose their original bodyguards, but having him not have a bodyguard who's following him all the time, if that is a potential outcome of me having done that, uh, that's a good thing for me. So, oh, and there actually is a place. Okay, there is a place where I can drag a body right there if nobody's watching. Let me see if I can pull that off. I'll drag him over there, and if I can do it with him... Then I can do it with Dawood. So you notice everybody has a dot when I'm dragging a body. Okay, nobody's watching. Okay, I've hidden one body in there. There's still room for a second body. Now he's got to figure out Okay, so now he, he wants to interrogate the prisoner again. And now we've got the waiting game, because he is going to come over here. That guy who was watching them is no longer with him, and I will be able to take him down and hide his body in that box. I've just got to wait now. So, chat, how are you all doing? Cloudcraft says, I hope you've learned a lesson about filling crates with bodies, Jeffrey. <laughs> yes. Because, well, basically, I just assumed that I was going to need to go further upstairs or something like that in order to make this work. Um, and that I needed to sort of have access to the stairwells and things. So that's why I, I thought I needed to take that guy down. But, all right, so is he is he on a tight cycle where he's just going to come right over here again? I got the impression that his path was more complex than that. But maybe that was just uh, an assumption I was making. Okay, yeah. It looks like we might have him. Let's use the fiber wire. The fiber wire is special because it's the only weapon you can hold in your hand and no one can see it in your hand. Oh no, oh, we got bad reception. You're, it's, oh, crap. No rest for the wicked, however. On to the next one. Right, let's do this quick. Yeah, so even though the garot, the fiber wire is is a little bit boring, um, because it's just it's his classic way of killing people, um, and so it doesn't feel like it's you know, as exciting as some of the other weird ways you can kill someone, like knocking them out with a fish and then breaking their neck, uh, which I did in Colombia. Um, it's still... Here, let me save my game. Um, 
it's got they give it some really strong advantages uh you can hold it in your hand and be ready to kill with it without anyone seeing it uh because you just hold it really tight uh and then you go straight from killing someone to dragging them it's not a separate step you have to line up so it can go much quicker all right so i'm just gonna save here and then this looks like can i just drop Or do I, what do I want to do here? Oh, this is what I want to do. I want to climb down this beam. Okay, got it. So the reason I'm taking a different way out is because I want to learn more about this place. So wow, so this elevator, for, for future playthroughs, I want to know more about how this place works. So, okay, this looks like a safe place to hide a body. I can shove someone down this hole. Um, Looks like that one guard that with the the guard with the dot that I took out earlier. Um, it looks like he. Okay, well, yeah, everybody has a. Pro oh, no, 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 I'm not here. Oh, oh shush. Okay, fine. <laughs> like I was saying, the guy with the dot. One of the things he does is look into this uh, elevator, and so it looks like there's multiple people whose job it is to look into this elevator. So you have to be very careful. So uh, uh, Rahul Baskaran says that uh, this level has many opportunities to take both of the targets out or their routines. Yeah, so so th that's sort of the thing that I love about Hitman is that there's so many possibilities. And it's not just so many scripted possibilities. Because, yeah, they'll have like multiple ways, multiple elaborate ways that they have specifically designed to take out each of the characters. But because the world is so simulated, um, I don't have to use any of those. I can just do whatever I want. And there's, there's so many just different ways to just, you know, that will just automatically work. Okay, so let's get down to the bottom floor and step off this time and be out of here before she notices. All right, good. That worked. All right, so I'm not exactly sure where I am relative to how I got in. But screwdrivers are very useful. Gonna hold on to that. Lots of places to hide bodies up here. Still not down at ground level. So the thing I wanted to learn here is how I would get up here in the future, in a later playthrough. It looks like this might be one way I could do it through that window. Because this gives me such great access. Like like later on when I try to do my suit only playthrough, this is probably gonna be how I get there. Um is by going up this uh, this elevator shaft. Okay, so we got a security camera here, door here. So I could probably get up this way. Okay, so getting up onto this floor is something I can keep in mind in the future as a thing that I should try to do. Okay, so nobody here is going to recognize me. And I'm not actually sure what even what side of the building I'm on right now. <laughs> I get completely turned around. Okay, I'm walking away from where I need to be. So, though, actually, I'm kind of curious what's over to the right here. That does seem like it's one way to get over. Ooh, finding the maelstrom. Okay, there's multiple different ways to find the maelstrom. All right, so I'm going to get out of the construction site. And uh, once I'm out of the construction site, we'll probably cut the video and then uh, and then go after our second target. Okay. Looks like I'm kind of out of dangerous territory here. Wait, application suspending in 15 minutes? No! That happened to me before. Uh, it didn't happen last time, so hopefully it won't happen this time. 47. Our intel suggests the Maelstrom is hiding somewhere in the city slums. I've marked the headquarters of the Crows on your map. Gotcha. Okay. So, let's just uh, let's save our game right here. We finished killing Dawadrangan, 
and we're ready to move on to either finding the maelstrom in crow territory, which is what's right in front of me, or uh, going after the woman of the train yard. That will save here. And, whoa, that's not the button I meant to hit. I meant to hit that button. <laughs> well, you know, whatever. <laughs> this isn't a professional stream. So, uh, anyway, uh, for those of you who are watching this later on YouTube, thank you for joining me on this video. Uh, I'll probably put uh, the next video up here, so you can just click on it and keep on going. Um, and you can subscribe. And the rest of you watching me live, stick with me. We're going to keep going with this mission.